Our next speaker, Dan Pallotta, is a builder of movements. He invented the multi-day charitable event industry, such as the breast cancer three-day walks and the multi-day AIDS rides. The model and methods he created are now employed by dozens of charities, and they raise in excess of $100 million annually for the important causes that he works on worldwide. Dan Pallotta. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. You having a good day so far? Great. All right. Well, I want to talk about social innovation and social entrepreneurship. I happen to have triplets. They're little. They're six years old. Sometimes I tell people I have triplets. They say, really, how many? Uh, uh, here's a picture of the kids. That's uh, Sage and Annalisa and Ryder. They were 3D printed. Uh, <laughs> I also happen to be gay. And I have to tell you that being gay and fathering triplets is by far the most socially innovative, socially entrepreneurial thing I have ever done. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was funny, I was sitting here during Eric's presentation, I think, I think he, he's, he's a cardiologist, I think he revealed that he was a cardiologist, and it made me think, uh, when I came out, when I was 19 years old or, or whatever, uh, my parents sent me to a cardiologist. <laughs> when, when I, it's a true story, when I was a little kid, I'd had a heart murmur. And the doctor said, you have to, he can't play sports anymore. He's very ill. He has to have open heart surgery immediately. And so they took me to uh, Mass General for a second opinion. And we met this wonderful cardiologist named Dr. Alan Goldblatt, who said, your son does have a heart murmur, but it's going to go away. And he doesn't need open heart surgery. So 19 years later, I told my mom, I said, uh, I think I'm gay. And you know what she said? Go see Dr. Goldblatt. That's so. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I didn't intend for this to be a talk on uh, coming out and gay fertility. Uh, I, uh, the real social innovation I want to talk about involves charity. Alan Savory talked about holistic approaches to management. I want to talk about a holistic approach to charity because we have a very unholistic, very dysfunctional approach to it. I want to talk about how the things we've been taught to think about charity and about giving and about the nonprofit sector are actually undermining the causes we love and our profound desire to change the world. But before I do that, I want to ask, do we even believe, you know, that the nonprofit sector has any serious role to play in changing the world? You know, a lot of people say now that business will lift up the developing economies and social business will take care of the rest. And I do believe that business will move the great mass of humanity forward. But it always leaves 10% behind. And social business requires markets. And there are some issues for which you just can't develop the kind of money measures that you need for a market. I sit on the board of a center for the developmentally disabled in Massachusetts. And these people want companionship and they want laughter, and they want love. You know, how do you monetize that? And that's where philanthropy and the nonprofit sector come in. Philanthropy is the market for love. It's the market for all those people for whom there is no other market coming. And so if we really want, the way Buckminster Fuller said, a world that works for everyone, with no one and with nothing left out, then the nonprofit sector has to be a serious part of the conversation. But it doesn't seem to be working. You know, why have our breast cancer charities not found a cure for breast cancer? Why have our homelessness charities not been able to end homelessness in any American city? Why has poverty remained stuck at 12% of the U.S. population? for four decades, now estimated to be at 
And I think that a critical part of the problem, not the whole issue, but a critical piece, is that these social problems and this human suffering is massive in scale. Our organizations are absolutely miniature up against the scale of that suffering, and we have a belief system that keeps them miniature. We have these two rule books. We have one for the nonprofit sector and one for the rest of the economic world. And I want to look at the way that this separate rule book discriminates against the nonprofit sector in five different areas. The first is compensation. So in the for-profit sector, the more value you produce, the more money you can make. But we don't like nonprofits to use money to incentivize people to produce more value in charity. In fact, we have a visceral reaction to the idea that anyone would make very much money helping other people. Now, it's interesting that we don't have a visceral reaction to the notion that people would make a lot of money not helping other people. You know? You want to make $50 million selling violent video games to kids, go for it. We'll put you on the cover of Forbes and Wired magazine but you want to invest half a million dollars in the right leader to try and find a cure for malaria, and you're considered a parasite yourself. And we think of this as our system of ethics, without realizing that this system has a very powerful side effect, which is it offers a very stark, mutually exclusive choice between doing very well for yourself and your family, because your family is invested in the decision to work in the nonprofit sector, or doing good for the world to the brightest minds coming out of our best universities and business schools and law schools, and sends tens of thousands of people who could make a huge difference in the nonprofit sector, marching instead directly into the for profit sector every year because they're simply unwilling to make the kind of lifelong economic sacrifice that this ethic requires of them. Business Week did a survey and looked at the compensation of MBAs 10 years out of business school. So these kids were 28 years old when they graduated. 10 years later, on average, they were 38 years old. And the median compensation for a Stanford MBA at the age of just 38 was $400,000. Meanwhile, the average salary for the CEO of a $5 million plus medical charity in the United States for the same year was $232,000. And for the CEO of a hunger charity in the US, a $5 million plus hunger charity, $84,000. Now, there's no way you're going to get a lot of people with $400,000 annual earning capacity to make a $316,000 sacrifice every single year to become the CEO of a hunger charity. The math of it is inescapable. It's literally cheaper for that person to donate $100,000 every single year to the hunger charity, save $50,000 on their state and federal taxes, so still be roughly $270,000 a year ahead of the game. Now be called a philanthropist because they donated $100,000 to charity probably sit on the board of the hunger charity, probably supervise the poor SOB who decided to become the CEO of the hunger charity, and have a lifetime of this kind of power and earning potential and popular praise still ahead of them. You know, some people will say to me, well, people should accept lower wages in the nonprofit sector because of the psychic benefit associated with helping other people. To which I've said, look, there's a hell of a lot of psychic benefit associated with making $400,000 a year and being able to donate, this is where the real psychic benefit comes in, to donate $100,000 to charity. Probably get your name put on the building of the hunger charity. And also, if you want to say that the trade-off is the psychic benefit, you're saying that there is zero psychic benefit in the for-profit sector. Like the people who work at April, Apple, miserable every day, like no sense that they're having any fun or making any contribution to the world. Groupon, Facebook, Twitter, the 3D company. The uh, second area of discrimination is advertising and marketing. So we tell the for-profit sector, spend, spend, spend on advertising until the last dollar no longer produces a penny of value. 
but we don't like to see our donations spent on advertising and charity. Our attitude is, look, if you can get the advertising donated, you know, at 4 o'clock in the morning or on a billboard behind a very healthy tree, I'm cool with that. But I don't want my donation spent on advertising. I want it to go to the needy. As if the money spent on advertising or substitute forms of advertising, if done correctly, could not bring in dramatically greater sums of money that could be used to serve dramatically greater numbers of people in need. In the 1990s, my company created, as was stated in the introduction, the long-distance AIDS ride bicycle journeys and the really beautiful 60-mile long breast cancer three-day walks. And over the course of nine years, we had 182,000 people ride or walk in one of those events. They raised a total of $581 million, all based on the simple idea that people are tired of being asked to do the least they can possibly do, that people yearn to be asked to take the full measure of their potential. But they have to be asked. You know, we got that many people to ride and to walk by taking out full page ads in the New York Times and prime time television ads and drive time radio spots. You know how many people we would have gotten to walk or to ride if we put up flyers in the dry cleaner the way most nonprofits are expected? Charitable giving has remained stuck at 2% of GDP in the United States ever since we started measuring it in the 1970s. That's an important fact because it tells us that in 40 years, the nonprofit sector has not been able to wrestle any market share away from the for profit sector. And if you think about it, how could one sector possibly take market share away from another sector if it isn't really allowed to market? You know, if we tell the giant consumer brands, you may advertise all the benefits of your product, but we tell charities, you cannot advertise all the good that you do. Where do we think all of the consumer dollars are going to flow? The third area of discrimination is the taking of risk specifically in pursuit of new revenue ideas. So Disney can make a $200 million movie that flops, and they did last year with John Carter, and nobody calls the Attorney General. But you do a little brand new, new idea, $1 million community fundraiser for the poor, and it doesn't produce a 60% profit to the cause in the first 12 months, and your character's called into question. So nonprofits are petrified of attempting any daring, brave, high-profile, big community fundraising endeavors for fear that if the thing fails, their reputations will be dragged through the mud. Well, when you prohibit failure, you kill innovation. If you kill innovation in fundraising, you can't raise more money. If you can't raise more money, you can't grow. If you can't grow, you cannot possibly solve social problems that are many times larger than you. The fourth area is time. So Amazon went for six years without returning any profit to investors. And everyone had patience. They knew there was a long-term objective down the line of building market dominance. But if a nonprofit organization ever had a dream of building something of magnificent scale, that required, imagine this, that required that for six years no money was going to go to the needy. It was all going to be invested in this building, this scale. We would expect people to be indicted. And the last area is profit itself. So the for-profit sector can pay people money in order to attract their capital for their risky ideas and their new ideas, but you can't pay profits in a non-profit sector, so the for-profit sector monopolizes the multi-trillion dollar capital markets and the non-profit sector is starved for growth capital and for risk capital. You put those five things together. You can't use money to lure talent away from the rest of the economy. You can't advertise on anywhere near the scale that the for-profit sector does to find new customers. You can't take the kinds of risks in pursuit of those customers as the for-profit sector. 
You don't have the same amount of time to find those customers as the for-profit sector, and you don't have a stock market with which to fund any of this, even if you could do it in the first place. And you've just put the non-profit sector at an extreme disadvantage to the rest of the economy on every level. And if we have any doubts about the effect of this separate rule book, this statistic is sobering. Since from 1970 to 2009, the number of nonprofits that really grew that crossed the $50 million annual revenue barrier is 144. Meanwhile, the number of for-profits that crossed it is 46,136. So we're dealing with social problems that are massive in scale and our organizations can't generate any scale. All of the scale goes to Coca-Cola and to Burger King. So why do we think this way? <clears throat> well, in the first draft of my book on charitable, the, the, the first draft was very angry. It was actually entitled America's Effed Up Ideas About Charity and my agent <laughs> thought she was going to have a hard time selling that so it mellowed over the course of the next three years before it was published. But in the first draft I, I had a sentence, you know, I grew up in New England 10 miles from where the first Puritans landed, from where the Salem witch trials happened. You know, I had internalized this Puritan deprivation Massachusetts mindset and I just had a sentence in the book that said these ideas come from old Puritan constructs. And my agent challenged me and she said, how do you actually know that? So I spent the next six months reading these narcolepsy inducing books on the early Puritan settlers to New England. And uh, we're going to spend a couple hours on the Puritans right now. <laughs> so hunker down, you got your pillows. <laughs> Anyway, the long and short of it was the Puritans came to the, to the New World for religious reasons, absolutely, but they also came here because they wanted to make a lot of money. They were very aggressive capitalists. These prayerful, pious, diminutive little people were accused of extreme forms of profit-making tendencies compared to the other colonists. But at the same time, the Puritans were Calvinists. So they were taught literally to hate themselves. They were taught that self-interest is a raging sea that is a sure path to eternal damnation. Well, this created a real problem for these people. Right here, they've come all the way across the Atlantic to make all this money. Making all this money will get you sent permanently, immediately, and directly to hell. So what were they to do about this? Well, charity became a big part of their answer. It became this economic sanctuary where they could do penance for their profit-making tendencies at five or ten cents on the dollar. So, of course, how could you make money in charity if charity was your penance for making money? A financial incentive got exiled from the realm of helping others so that it could thrive in the area of making money for yourself. And we're still stuck with that system today. Now, this Puritan ideology and this separate rule book get policed by this one very dangerous question, which is what percentage of my donation goes to the cause versus overhead? And we want the amount going to the cause to be very high, the amount going to overhead to be very low. Makes sense if you don't think about it for 30 seconds. But if you think about it for 30 seconds, the logic of it begins to evaporate very quickly and never underestimate the ability of human beings to not think about things for 30 seconds, right? <laughs> now, there are some of you, a few of you in this room that are old enough to remember that there was a time in human history and we lived through it and it lasted for decades when we walked around the airports dragging the luggage before it dawned on us that we could put wheels on the suitcases, <laughs> right? So if it took us that long to figure out wheels on suitcases, you can imagine how long it might take us to inquire into whether there might be some problems with this essentially economic question. Well, there are a lot of problems with it. I'm going to just, in the interest of time, focus on two. First, it makes us think that overhead is not part of the cause. But it absolutely is, especially if it's being used for growth. Now this idea that overhead steals from the cause or is not part of the cause creates this second much larger problem which is it forces organizations to go without the overhead things they really need to grow in the interest of meeting public demand to keep overhead low. So we've all been taught for example that charities should spend as little as possible on overhead things like fundraising under the theory that well look you can see the less you spend on fundraising the more money there is available for the cause. That's true if it's a depressing world in which this pie can never be made any bigger. But if it's a world of possibility, and if it isn't, by the way, we should all just go home anyway, 
If it's a world of possibility and a logical world in which investment in fund raising actually raises more funds, then we have it precisely backwards and we should be spending a great deal more money on fundraising, not less, because fundraising is the one thing that has the potential to multiply the amount of money available for the cause that we care about so deeply. I'll give you two examples. We launched the AIDS rides with an initial investment of $50,000 in risk capital. And within nine years, we had multiplied that 1,982 times into $108 million net after all expenses in unrestricted money for AIDS services. We launched the Breast Cancer Three Days with an initial investment of $350,000 in risk capital. And in that case, within just five years, we had multiplied it 554 times into $194 million net after all expenses in unrestricted money for breast cancer research. Now, if you were a philanthropist really interested in breast cancer, what would make more sense? Go out and find the most innovative breast cancer researcher in the world and give her $350,000 and insist that 100% of it be spent on research and essentially purchase $350,000 worth of breast cancer research, or go out and find the most innovative breast cancer researcher in the world and give her fundraising department the $350,000 to potentially multiply it into $194 million for breast cancer. 2002 was our most successful year ever. We netted for breast cancer alone $71 million that year alone, and then we went out of business very suddenly and very traumatically. Why? Well, our sponsor wanted to distance themselves from us because we were being crucified in the media for investing 40% of the gross in recruitment and customer service. And there is no accounting terminology to describe that kind of investment in the future and in the magic of the experience other than this demonic label of overhead. So on one day, all 350 of our great employees lost their jobs because they were labeled overhead. Our sponsor went and did the events on their own. Their overhead went up. Their net income for breast cancer grants went down by 85% or $60 million in one year. This is what happens when we confuse frugality with morality. See, we've all been taught that the bake sale with 5% overhead is morally and economically superior to the professional fundraising enterprise with 40% overhead. But did you ever notice something? Did you ever notice that we're always shown these pie charts at the same scale? So we're missing the most critical piece of information, which is what is the actual size of these pies? Who cares if the bake sale only had 5% overhead if it's tiny? What if the bake sale only netted $71 for the cause because it made no investment in its scale and the professional fundraising enterprise netted $71 million because it did? Now, which pie looks more attractive and which pie do we think people who are hungry would prefer? Here's how all of this fits into the big picture. I said that charitable giving is 2% of GDP. That's about $300 billion a year. But only about 20% of that, or $60 billion, goes to health and human services charities that address the worst forms of human suffering. The rest goes to religion and higher education and hospitals, and that $60 billion is not nearly enough to solve these problems. But if we could move charitable giving from 2% of GDP up just one point to 3% of GDP, that would represent an extra $150 billion in contributions. And if that money could go disproportionately to the health and human services portion of the sector, that would represent a tripling of revenues to that sector. Now we're talking scale. Now we're talking the potential for real change. But it is never gonna happen by forcing these organizations to lower their horizons to the demoralizing objective of keeping their overhead low. None of us wants our epitaph to read, we kept charity overhead low. We want it to read that we changed the world. 
And the part of the way we did that was by changing the way we think about these things. So the next time you're looking at a charity, don't ask about the rate of their overhead. Ask about the scale of their dreams. Their Google, their Apple, their Microsoft scale dreams. What progress they're making toward those dreams and what resources they need to make them come true regardless of the overhead. Who cares what the overhead is if this human suffering is getting addressed? If we can have that kind of generosity, a generosity of thought, then the nonprofit sector can play a massive role in changing the world for all those citizens most desperately in need of it to change. And if that could be our generation's enduring legacy, that we took responsibility for the thinking that had been handed down to us, we didn't just accept it. We revisited it, we revised it, and we reinvented the whole way humanity thinks about changing things forever, for everyone, well, I thought I would let the kids summarize what that would be. That would be a real social innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So I got a question. Terrific talk. And it's so clear and the message is so compelling and the numbers are so clear. So what do you see as the psychological barrier that prevents everybody from, prevents the world from jumping on and saying, all right, let's do this? They haven't seen this talk. Okay. <laughs> I mean, literally, we haven't tried to teach them otherwise. We keep telling the donating public what they want to hear. Charities believe that donors want low overhead. They don't want to stick their neck out, so they keep telling donors we have low overhead. So donors keep thinking, well, low overhead makes for the good charity. So, uh, so the thing we have to do is change the way the public thinks about these things. Great. Well, we'll help you spread the word. All right. Thanks, thank you. Dan. Okay. Thanks, everyone.